We thought we had covered just about every possible genre, but you guys said that we were wrong and you know, where were the shoot 'em ups where were horror games, where was like some random esoteric genre I had never even heard of before. So in this final, truly final installment, we're surely, going, we're going to cover all the remaining genres and how good are they to make as an indie developer and should you even bother with them. So similar concept to the previous two videos, if you haven't checked those out. We take the genres, I've prepared them, he doesn't really know that much about it. And yeah, we'll just cover how good they are and how feasible they are as an indie developer, in our opinion. We've made our own game before, so I feel like we have a little bit of credibility. You guys will still probably disagree. Leave them in the comments down below. It boosts engagement. Important to notice what we are maybe judging them on, because I don't think it was clear in the last two videos. We judge on if we think it's feasible to make money, how good they are as an indie developer, like if scope-wise, and how is the competition, basically. And how hard are they to make, Yeah, basically. and the technical part, too. All right, so let's jump into the first one immediately, and that is City Builders, Colony Sims, and games similar like that. So the triple, I always give some examples here. Triple A games could be City Skylines or City Skylines 2 now, something like Tropico or NO 1800. And then if you look more at the indie side, that could be something like a Banished is a really solid example, or Kingdoms and Castles or Mini Motorways. Basically, you're building a little city and you're managing it. Doesn't matter what time it is, could be in deep space, could be just in like 1800th century. Both of them work. They are very mechanics driven, I think is the main thing. And I think that is pretty solid to start with because a lot of your viewers are coders, we've found out. And you want to make a game that's more mechanics heavy if your coding is your main strength. Because you're not having to deal that much with creating a deep narrative or, you know, like an open world. It's much easier to have a like defined scope. But I do think scope creep is also a bit harder because, you know, you can keep expanding upon basically everything. It's like, oh, I'm making a city builder and then it's like, I'm going to add trains or I'm going to add like motorways or you can keep basically adding depth to your game. And I think it's really hard to find a point where you're like, okay, this is everything I want to have in my game because you'll always be able to do more with it. Yeah, don't add trains, it's a trap. Right, Marnix? We, we don't have trains, so we wouldn't be able to know. Good. I think it's also pretty solid. It's very team dependent. So if you're a team full of artists, you are basically committing suicide if you pick this genre, so don't do that. I would focus on this kind of genre if you're, for example, a team like us. Um, we are very, yeah, Going, go driven uh, as developers, so it's good for us. The main downside of this genre, I think, is it's hard to show visuals early on that are captivating for modern platforms like TikTok or so on, because usually they want to see something flashy, and while it can be very satisfying to see the city operate, basically, it's not very flashy and people might not uh, like it on the social media as much. I think that's kind of a good point, but there's something wrong with all. You have a lot of cozy world builders as well, such as like a circle of Kurzoven. It's like a city builder or like a colony builder, not fully sure. And they have really gone into that aesthetic. I feel, however, that it's, you know, it's a bit getting saturated. I know Chris Zubkowski is also like, make the Steam lives the crafting games and the building games, things like that. But I feel like there's only so many ways you can make a city or you can make a medieval city. So I think if you're starting now, it can be hard to find out what's gonna make me unique, really. So let's grade it. I a. Would, yeah, A. Okay, oh. yeah, that was easy. <laughs> too easy. No, I wanted F tier. Okay, no. So yeah, I think it's a pretty solid A tier. Um, depends a bit on your team. It's easy to get into as a developer as well because, you know, you have grid-based systems usually. It's very rigid, a lot of predefined actions basically. If I place down this building, this is going to happen. It's only A tier if you know how to code well though because it is quite technically challenging. Next up is horror games. These are things like Five Nights at Freddy's, Amnesia, Slenderman, you know, the very crude maybe games. I feel Escape the Backrooms is another great one. These games are, I don't know how to describe them. I don't really play horror games because I'm the biggest scaredy cat there is, but there's a very big audience for it, I've realized. Horror games are one of those things that I have been sleeping on, but honestly, Horror games are great as indies, in my opinion, because you don't need to have them polished, really. And still, like, the fact that they're not as polished is actually part of the horror charm, you know. You can have, like, very crude graphics and just, yeah, work from that. Also, generally, your players don't really require as much playtime. Like, a horror game that's between 30 minutes and, like, two hours, that's already, like, a decent-sized indie game. Like, you have a lot of games. I think Escape the Backrooms is only, like, a few hours as well. So I think it's pretty solid there. Yeah, generally, I also think it's pretty solid. It helps, it basically forces you to learn very important parts of game development, like 
game feel, pacing, playing with expectations. Jump scares. Yeah, for example. So I think it's very good to like understand how a player interacts with the game and focus on the feeling that you want to portray. I also think technically they are not the hardest. Like, no. From the systems that I have in my mind, it's not that hard. And I also think it's a genre with a lot of freedom. For example, you have that Thomas the Tank Engine spider game. Yeah. I think that's an indie, right? Yeah, it's an indie game. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, so you also have a lot of creativity and it makes you have a unique way to stand out. So it's a genre like Five Nights at Freddy's or that Thomas the Tank Engine game. They are completely different visually. They are completely different what makes them scary, so to say. So I think you have a lot of freedom with this one. And I like it. Actually. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't even have to be like, you can be very flexible in the platform, basically. So something like a visual novel could perfectly work as well, even like Omori uh, is, I think, one, or, you know, even Doki Doki, very obvious one. They are horror games. You can make them as hard or as easy as you want. I think one thing that I would like you to like spend a bit of time on if you try and make these games is visuals you can leave out a bit. Doesn't have to be that good. Like just put a fancy shader on it that like demakes it. But look into good sound design. I think that is probably going to be the hardest challenge or like the most important part. The ambience. Of yeah, having that ambience, like not just walking around in dead silence, but you know, having like your forests or whatever and like making sure that the sound is really nice. One other thing, marketing these games. I feel like it's easy and hard at the same time. The moment you have one YouTuber, a single one, pick up on your game, you know, it's like the dream of everyone, get picked up by a Markiplier and things like that, or I think Jeff Jacksepticeye. The moment that happens, you're in. There's like, okay, you just like, you catch the money and then, uh, you're set for a while. There is also a lot of garbage horror games, however, and I think then it can be a bit harder to stand out on Steam. But if you like spend a little bit of effort into marketing it, so that is probably making some like TikToks. TikToks do really great for horror movies or like, you know, the short form content reels. I know a developer as well, we've had a lot of success on it. And then like a bigger YouTuber gets their eyes on your game, then you're set. And I think that is your main goal really should be to find that audience. Yeah, I agree. It's the most important part of the ambiance, it, but it's, it's, it's the thing you have to do in a lot of genres if you want to make something with a story. So I think it's a great way to get started because you're forced to focus on that part because that's basically your entire game. So uh, where do you rank it? I feel, I, I'm looking at this list and I'm like, I feel like everything is gonna be like A tier. This is not great. We should have put City Builders at B. Yeah, uh, the, the thing is with City Builders, I already think like, damn, we kind of give it a very good score because... Maybe we're a bit generous. Yeah. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put City Builders to B because one of one big difference is City Builders take a long time to develop, like quickly, like mm. caveating. Horror games, you can just like make in like very short development cycles, whereas City games, you know, they are like games that take like at least like six to 12 months minimum to like get your early access version out there. City That's ambitious. Yeah, that's ambitious, but still, that's what I mean. You can make like five horror games in the time of one city builder. So I'm going to put city builders to B, and I would personally put horror at A. Yeah, I can live with that. Because I also thought horror was better, but I couldn't give it an S tier. Then this next genre isn't really a genre. It's more of a style of making games. And that is not, oh, I have this great game idea. I'm going to make it from scratch. No, you're going to actually link into an existing game and start modding it. So things like Minecraft has a very big modding community. Any Bethesda game really has a really solid modding community. Terraria as well. I think it's a really good start to get into game development because especially I know a lot of software engineers who are like, hey, I'm pretty solid at Java and I've played a lot of Minecraft. Let me make some Minecraft mods just for like fun or, you know, like some Skyrim updates. If it's a very open and extensible game, then it helps in just understanding how do some systems work, but you don't have to deal with all of game development yet at the, the beginning. One problem is monetizing. Minecraft has a pretty solid way. I think you can sell mods. They have like a marketplace. I know a developer that's making some money already through it. Skyrim, I think, you know, there is like paid mods, but I think it's more frowned upon sometimes to have. Yeah, I think mods. it's usually like free mods and Patreon or something. That's yeah. basically the monetization system that I feel a lot of creators have. I think it's like you said, it's good to get into uh, game development because yeah, it's pretty isolated. It's also good because if you, for example, only have, an, uh, have artistic skills, you don't have to write a single line of code if you just retexture everything. Or the same with coding. If you're like, don't want to make models, you can just like create something like new behavior for enemies or whatever in Skyrim without having to do art. So I think it greatly can play to your strengths. 
Now, there's also a risk because then, of course, you won't develop into a full-fledged software developer because you want to know a bit of everything at least. Monetization, problem. Marketing, I think also a problem because, I mean... Yeah, you're already stuck with how big the game is. Of course, yeah. Skyrim and Minecraft, they have huge player bases. But they also have like 500,000 mods. Yeah, and it's not like... Then you have like, as I said, like a, you have like a curse force and you have to hope that your mod gets popular there or a Steam workshop. I think it's a lot harder there because you won't really be that much actively trying to market a mod. Maybe you'll put it on like the subreddit of the game and be like, hey, I made this mod, but that's about it. So when we said how we were going to create them, one of the things was how feasible is as an indie. And in that opinion, I also see this as how likely are you to survive of this? And that's, so I put it a bit lower yeah. than the previous two. So not everything will be A tier, so that's good. I would put this one at a C tier. I was thinking D tier. Mm. Because yeah. there is probably, there's a big gap between it's, city builder and... Yeah. It's really good to start, but I think once you've made like one or two mods, you should really look into any other kind of game. Or even just like, you know, take the game that like you've been modding, because you probably modded because there's something that the game is missing, and use that as an inspiration to fuel your like full-on game development. TDS is getting experience in game development, not as an end product, is yeah. what I would say. Yeah, D tier, pretty solid. Next up is party games. Of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is Mario Party. These are basically games that you play with a group of friends, usually in person, but you can also do it on Discord, where you do basically random things, play some mini games. Some other examples are Keep Talking and No One Explodes, yeah. Jackbox, yeah. Uh, like Check Party. No, and checkbox party. Checkbox, yeah, they have like 15 different checkbox versions. Yeah. Also, you know, the, the drawing I ones. Them. I have no clue, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> but yeah, basically games that you always have to play in a group. And I think by just saying that, I already said the biggest downside is a game like this. You need friends. You need, no, <laughs> you don't need friends because we're you not- You need people. You need players because we're looking at this as indie developers. If you have a game, I know Party Animals had this problem a bit. They had a bit of controversy because, you know, it's a party game, but every single person still had to buy the game. And it was like 17, 18 euros, I think. People don't like that. Usually, like one person has like the checkbox license and then they can like invite friends to join their server. I think the biggest problem indeed is just you're already handicapping the amount of people that can like actually play the game because you're only going to be able to like play the game with friends or like you're only like players are going to be players who have friends. I mean, I think most party games you can actually play on your own. I just think no one does it. Yeah, because it's, it's not the point. That's the not game. the point. Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do? Try hard like Mario Party. I feel like I'm saying something that's going to get me canceled, but yeah. I'm sorry if you're that person that really loves to play Mario Party on your own, but I don't think that's what the game design is intended. I think development wise, they're pretty all right because the mechanics usually, you know, Part of the mechanics is usually like wonky physics. It's like a very easy one or just like weird controls, very short like mechanics, nothing too in-depth. Like people don't expect like super high quality, like deep knowledge because it's a game that you should be able to just pick up when you've never played it before and get going like in seconds. It's also very visual. So I think because usually you have like flashy effects and like you see people moving, they're really fun to play. I think just, yeah, the biggest problem is having that audience that also needs to have friends and actually have a purpose for playing party games. I personally have no party games. I don't have any friends. I only have colleagues that I call, like to call my friends. Yeah, basically, I agree with what you say, but there's also something that I think is very strong about party games, which is you basically design 10 different games inside your party game. Mm. This is a great way to gain experience as a game designer to test mechanics, you basically create 10 itch.io games that you would have put out for free. You can just cram it into a party game and suddenly you have a big game, so to say. Yeah, that's true. And the most important part, if you want to become a game designer, is that your game is fun. Yeah. And by having a party game, your number one priority is actually to be as fun as possible. For a game designer perspective, I think this is a very, very strong contender for a good rating. But if you're like a coder, this is probably something that is too easy for you if you want a real challenge. So if you are basically, if we would make a party game, I think William and maybe myself would have been bored with the code we have to write because it's all very isolated and small while we worked on a big yeah, mechanic driven game. So once again, it's very team dependent, I think. But generally, I think this is a pretty solid one. Would we go for A or B? I'm not sure. I feel like I, would, I wouldn't put it at A actually. I would put it at B or C. I was thinking B or C because you are basically asking people uh, you limit the amount of players you have because a lot of people 
even while Sony and Microsoft maybe say otherwise, I think a lot of people still play solo games a lot. Yeah. And if I look at a game, I probably look at how many hours am I going to get out of it on my own because I cannot count on Marnix or William to always be there to play a game with me. They have to work, you know? Uh, I would say... C? Yeah, C, just because I think you limit the audience a lot. These are games that I think are really fun in the right setting, but they really suffer yeah, depending on your audience. They are definitely are viable though. Next up, we have point and click games. So these are things like 12 minutes, if you look at the AAA aspect more, and then also something like a Papers, Please, or more, you know, I feel like story-based games such as Chance of Senar is one that is something that I've been like enjoying recently. I think, yeah, the main point is you just use your mouse as the primary point of input. Uh, Return to Monkey Island is another like very big name. So games like that. Generally, I feel like the problem is that there's not that much like riveting gameplay and mechanics and it's more about the story and the visuals. So I think that immediately like differentiates should you make this game yes or no. If you're an artist, don't make the city builders is I feel like a bit of my idea. But if you have like a really cool shader like Chance of Sonar has or like a really good visual aesthetic like even maybe a journey, then go with like more of a point and click game because your game needs to be very visual. Yeah, and marketability is also really lacking i think in this genre because okay they do look different but like you said you have, don't have a lot of like riveting gameplay which already means you eliminate like half of the the ways things are marketed now as games yeah I think a lot if, of publicity is lost i think if you look at the trailer of papers please it's like yeah you're stamping but i think making that trailer i don't know i don't know the developers but i feel like it would have been really hard to make that trailer actually engaging already and make sure that it's like yeah. they do it pretty solid but it is really hard to get yeah. like the most like engaging parts of that game, put them into a trailer and then go on from there. Yeah, I think if, no offense if you created Papers, Please, because um, I, I do actually like the game. If you would have made Papers, Please today and no YouTubers would have picked up on it because haha, funny, I can stamp and stuff like that, no one would buy it. It, it succeeded because the influencers got caught of it and the idea behind it was fun, but you cannot really count on that to happen. So if you want to market directly to your target audience, yeah, that's not really very engaging. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think Papers, Please also, the, I forgot the name of the game he made before, but the same developer is like also very good at like very stylized and visual mm -hmm. games. I don't know the name, but I'll put B-roll up of it. So I think there he had like part of the talent already. He had part of the backing, which like helped him with the marketing. But I think if it's like your first game, it's like point and click. If you're a programmer, don't do it, basically. If you're an artist, pretty solid. But then I do think I have another genre coming up. So stay tuned for that. That could be better for it. It's, it's not the one I'm thinking of, It's right? not the one okay, you're thinking good. of. <laughs> so let's rate it. C tier as well. Yeah, I agree. I didn't want to put it as low as the modding because modding is basically hard for monetization, but it's also unfair to put it higher. Next up is shoot em ups and bullet hells. Yeah, shoot em ups, bullet hells. You guys, I feel like we got so many comments of like, oh my God, you forgot shoot em ups or like shmups. How could you have done that? Well, here we are. We are yeah. delivering the message of the Lord. We are the Messiah. So basically it's a, uh, yeah, if there are more bullets on the screen than there are enemies or then you can count, it's probably a shoot 'em up yeah. So things like on Vampire Survivors, what do you have on these? Rotato, Rotato is another big right. one. Bounty of One, uh, 20 minutes till dawn. Basically, I mean, we're saying shoot 'em ups it's, I feel like we're merging a bit of the genres together here because 20 minutes and um, Vampire Survivors are more like more time-based, whereas in Brotato, if I remember correctly, isn't really time-based, more wave-based. You shoot a lot of guns, basically, uh, usually in a top-down perspective, either 2D or I've seen a few 3D ones, but not as many. I think they're great. I also think they're great. Especially because we're in a bit of a shoot 'em up renaissance right now. I still think we're at the we're like at the top right now. So, you know, we had the same with roguelites. Roguelites suddenly exploded or like battle royales. I think right now, because of the su success of Vampire Survivors, a lot of people are jumping on that survivor-like game. So I think if you're gonna start a game with like a two-year development cycle now based upon that, don't do it. But usually these games don't require that long of a development cycle either. Biggest problem right now is gonna be like, similar with the colony building is what's gonna make you unique? Because for example, okay, Crafty Survivors is a great example of like, okay, we have this game, 
how do we make ourselves unique? Oh, we'll add crafting to it. And that's it basically. That's already out now. So now the challenge for you really is how do I make it unique? Because that's gonna be a very important thing with marketing because marketing itself, there's a lot of things happening on screen, lots of flashes and like effects that shouldn't be too hard. You can have a pretty decent visual style, but it's just, you know, not making the same like game as everyone else is doing. That's the main issue right now. Yeah, I, I agree they are great because I think purely from a technical perspective, they are probably not the hardest game to make. Uh, you probably create a lot of content and we get another god ray. Uh, so there is actually a son in Belgium who knew. So I think from a technical perspective, they are definitely not the hardest game to make. I also think you don't have to have a long, lot like development cycle because content I think can be pretty procedurally generated, all those things. Mm -hmm. so, it's pretty easy to create content, you just have to do it well. From a skills perspective, I think actually both artists and programmers can have a say in this. So yeah. it's a very open genre, bonus points. Marketability, bonus points, because I think it's pretty easy to market. Okay, if you're, Uniqueness. If you're not gonna make a bad point, I'm gonna go what with is, S tier. Wait. No, it's not S tier. It's not S tier? Well, then no. I wanna know why. Because you're always like, it's so great, it's so great. What's bad about it? The downsides of this genre are, I think like you said, the timing. You have a lot of competition. That's the only, that alone is already a reason I don't want to give it S tier mm -hmm. because the market is getting more saturated. If you start now, you're probably a bit too late. You should have started like last tier list we made like half a year ago, yeah. <laughs> but we didn't cover it. So damn, it's on us. I wouldn't give it S though. Mm, I do still really like it. I mean, sure. A is my pretty question, likable. My question to you, because the, the landscape has evolved and we've learned a lot as well. If we go back to our first tier list, mm -hmm. would you say a survivor like is better than a platformer but our, our first uh, but i think we overvalued platformer really highly yeah because there we put it at s tier no 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 you have to be. watch the video to know what rank we well, gave if this is the first video watching we put it at s tier there but honestly it wasn't really s tier i feel like survivor like if there is a s tier genre it is going to be this one i think another genre on this list is s tier no <laughs> yes no I, I, I think A tier. I'm gonna put it at A plus. I put it above horror, but not S tier. It's like an A plus. That's fine. I'm fighting for you guys. I, I believe this is a pretty solid. It's a very good genre. I agree. There is just one better. <laughs> Next up is sports sims. Of course, everyone knows the FIFAs, but what about... It's not forward? FIFA anymore. Yeah, It's sure. called FC24. Yeah. Screw FIFA. EA Football Club. Yeah, whatever. That thing. Also, like... Golf with friends, you have things like Stellapshot, Rebound, Super Pool, like a lot of things that basically simulate a sport because who likes to move anyway? It, it, it really depends how you tackle this one, I think. If you tackle this from a, I want to be realistic, like X FIFA. Yeah, or whatever. you have a lot of like pro cycling manager. I think yeah. those are horrible games to make yeah, as an indie developer. Do but if you do something wonky, like... <laughs> what? That, that's, the, that's the perfect way to describe it. Take a sport, Make it wonky, make like the physics kind of yeah. weird, make the controls a bit weird. Add like, I don't know, like anti-gravity pads or whatever to your yeah. game. Like teleporters in your golf game, why not? Yeah, or like Rocket League, it's like, let's just add flying cars and we'll deal with it like that. Yeah. Then I think it's pretty okay. Yeah, I agree. I think it's also relatively easy to find ideas then because it's just like, okay, what's a sport that I have an idea of? Maybe like, I don't know if this exists, but for example, it's like, it's a rugby game. I'm making this up right now. But it's like ragdoll physics. Oh, I, I thought flamingos. Rugby with flamingos. That's no. You can you can take this idea and earn one hundred thousand dollars easily. Well, if you add ragdolls, you can earn five hundred thousand dollars. I feel just like flamingos with ragdolls, and you have a multi-million dollar idea. <laughs> so yeah, I think it is pretty good. Then I'm not. I would put it at B tier. If you tackle it this way, yes. If you tackle it from realism, yeah. you are probably it, going to see F tier from us. Yeah, if, if you're like, I'm gonna make a new pro cycling manager or like NBA, whatever. I mean, you don't have the, the rights, but yeah. like you call it shitty basketball or whatever. <laughs> and then you try to be realistic. I think if you go for realism, it's an F tier. Yeah. Pretty much if you do it like we say, like make it a bit more wonky, make it like unique, then it's a B tier. Yeah, I can live with that. This next genre is ground strategy and 4X games. We partially covered this in our first year so we had like the very broad strategy thing that was way too broad um, basically games like Stellaris or Civilization 6 
or one that we even covered from one of our viewers on this channel, uh, it's Stellar Sovereigns. Basically, it's, you know, you're managing an entire world. Hearts of Iron 4, I think, is another one. So it's like a very high level, like continent-wide, planet-wide, or even like planetary systems-wide. Managing of things, very UI-driven games as well, very strategy-driven. You know, Stellaris, it's like, oh, I'm gonna play quickly one round of Stellaris, and it's like four hours later once you've actually finished. I think these games... If you are an artist, it's F tier. If you are not an artist and a coder, it's pretty good, I think. Marketability suffers, but the there is definitely a community. There is a very hardcore yeah. audience for these kinds of and games. And they have money, so they will probably buy your game. One thing, though, is they often require even bigger scopes than city builders. Mm -hmm. That's my main issue, because it's basically a city builder on steroids with like combat added to it and yeah, all of those things. More systems. More systems. So if you don't do this if you're just purely an artist. Definitely. If you're a coder, you can try it, but usually these games have like very long development cycles. You have to go into early access basically to be able to sustain yourself. That's, they are complex. Yeah, they're extremely complex. So I wouldn't tackle this as your first game. Also, if you have these games, often there's a multiplayer aspect. Mm. We are always like, try not to go for multiplayer. You can always play these games in single player, but yeah. like the big ones you can like do like versus other players. I would put it at C or D even. D feels wrong because like the genre is pretty good. There is still demand for it. You have a, a diehard community. So that's all plus points. But at the same time, we give party, I think, C tier because of the multiple player part. Mm -hmm. And if we also want to have multiple players here and a single player, it's bigger scope. But I would say mods are worse. So we always screw ourselves up in this tier list. C minus. C minor, sure. <laughs> Call it a day. I think it's definitely doable. Yeah. You have to have a very niche team though, because not everyone can make this kind of game. Yeah, you really need to go into it with a solid plan and be ready to have that runway to develop on it for multiple years. The problem with these games is scope creep is basically another thing. You need to have everything you can think about because everything is part of like the strategy and the mechanics, which mm -hmm. makes it a really long development cycle. And that's why I generally don't suggest it. If you are a programmer, you can skip this next genre because this is not going to be for you. If you're an artist, this is probably going to be more in your style and that is a hidden object game. I know it sounds a bit niche, but we actually have a few Belgian developers who've made some pretty uh, solid hidden object games, uh, Hidden Through Time, and they just released their sequel, Hidden Through Time 2, which means that there was an audience for it. Of course, things like Where is Waldo are the great inspiration. And then you have other stuff such as The Room or A Little to the Left where it's basically, you have to try and find stuff. You find an object or things like that. And yeah, that's basically the whole thing. It's a bit of a puzzle kind of game. You have to look at it. It's usually very nice aesthetic backgrounds. It leads with Hidden Through Time. Hidden Through Time, you can also like even make like custom maps as like a player. I think they do it pretty solid. These games have like very low amounts of programming required generally because you know, it's just, I put a collider. If you click on the right image and then perfect. It's just a matter of making enough levels. Yeah, and I also think marketability, once again, I think it's harsh, no? Har yeah, I think marketability is kind of a pain. I think everything else is pain. I think it's easy to make, <laughs> but actually making money is like a big no-no, or at least making it like somewhat profitable because there's a pretty small audience for it, I feel. Generally, these are also games that you can't really ask that much money for. They're usually like mm -hmm. between two to like ten dollars at most for these styles and it's more a matter of you have to pump out a lot of games with like all like have like 32 puzzles or whatever if that's your thing you can go for it but i personally don't feel like that's really it also point and click is very static usually hard to market again but if you are an artist and you have like an artistic style it can be a really good way to use that style that you have and like make something unique that way yeah it's a great portfolio builder i guess <laughs> Man, just say you want to put it in F tier at that point. <laughs> I don't think it's that bad. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you do make a good, good point, though. I would not rate pretty highly, though. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure about... I would put it in a D minus. I yeah. feel like mods would even be better, almost. I mean, if you're a viewer and you're making one of those games, please prove us wrong. But I also think, like, between D or E. Yeah, we'll put it in between there. Then. Great. Also, if you're getting an aneurysm because how we basically space out our uh, items on our tier list, Leave we know down. it's wrong. Leave a comment down below. Boost engagement. Ah. Last but 
definitely not least. You want to have the honors? Uh, I'll we, say it. I, I didn't tell him that we were doing this genre up I until like know. two minutes before we started recording. And like I, he was reading through the list and he was like, you could see his eyes glow up. So yeah, I think this, this genre is so unique. If uh, you stuck around till now, <laughs> this is the content that we make here at Bite Me Games. Like we do not say what the regular people, I don't think there's any other tier list where they tell you to make Adult only games. Yeah, so adult only games. I don't actually know a lot of examples. Open the list real quick. I have a list for you. Yeah. Because what do you mean? You need a lot of research. You, you don't have to pretend. You know exactly. <laughs> you don't. have like 10 games in your. It's such a lie. So we have Hootie Pop, which is Honey a match. Honey Pop, which is a match three games. Mirror, which is a match three game. We have Deep Space Waifu, which is a bullet hell. So, hey, multiple genres. Village Rhapsody, which is a farming simulator. Also, I feel like it's going to be really hard to put B-roll up of these kinds of games. Your problem. I was doing like research for this <laughs> list. I have to cleanse my soul after that. Wait, there is a strategy yeah. resource management game? You have Kaiju Princess, which is like you, you adopt this girl, I think, who's also a Kaiju. And you have to like plan how you're going to destroy cities. Is and Kaiju the, like the... Godzilla, Godzilla Kong, yeah, like those okay. monsters. Um, okay. <laughs> and then, yeah, you can also do adult stuff with them. Also, a lot of people on our visual novel tier list, they were like, oh my God, guys, you forgot about all the 18 plus stuff. We knew about it. Back then, we just didn't have the we balls to put it on a list. Yeah, we're innocent. Uh, I honestly, you're going to hate me for this, but I think this is probably the best genre on the list. It's one of the best. I, I think it's the best. If you uh, Marketing, you don't have to do it. There are a lot of horn balls out there. <laughs> So this is, you know, <laughs> back when we were releasing Forge Industry, I kind of cried a little bit because we were like looking, it was like a few days before release and we were looking at like the popular upcoming and then like the new release and we're like, oh, are we in it? And it was like, number one was like some big ass AAA game that released. And then number three, four and five were all like very shitty adult games that were yeah. just like basically asset flips. It's just like throw some art together that's like 18 plus and like do a match tree or puzzles are also very common or hidden objects really. If Bite Me Games fails, this is our plan for real. We, we make sellout team. studios and sellout studios is just going to make games like this because there's a lot, a lot of money in it, I think. Yeah, it's really sad. You just have to sell your soul. Yeah. You have to sell out. And and I think if we go to like a, any gaming convention and we're like, <laughs> hey, what do you make? Instead of being like, hey, we make strategy games, we talk about like, hey, I make this game where you play as a VR character who can have sex with anime girls. <laughs> No one will have like no one will see you serious anymore. So that is also something you need to keep in mind. But holy shit! Speaking of VR games, there's like a oh, VR God. game out there. It's 50 euros, and there's like a 70 euro DLC on top of that, just with like AI chat girls or like AI anime what? girls you can talk to. It's crazy. So if you're lonely, that's maybe the game for you. There's a lot of money in this stuff. I have like I don't get it. Um, yeah, honestly. If you're in the, the, in the scene and you want to make money, this is your best bet, I think, as an indie. One thing, though, is... Of all genres. You need art. That's a big problem. You can't just be a programmer. It's hard to get the art right. <laughs> okay, if you say so. I haven't tried it, so I don't know. I mean, you, that's the whole thing. You have, like, very high-poly 3D models that are very realistic in all aspects. <laughs> Or you need to have like a very good like drawn style as well, which usually means that you are active already in like an artsy community. And again, as I said, you know, it is looked a bit down upon as well if you actually make that kind of game. So I should... If you don't care what people think it's S tier, I will die on this hill. <laughs> you are gonna die then. <laughs> I think honestly it is an A tier, at least. Just to spite people, we have to put it in S tier. Though. Okay, we're gonna put it in S tier just to spite people, just to like make you happy. I mean, you just have to sell out. But if you actually don't care about other people's if opinion, you hard and you want money, and you hard commit, yeah, it's I, it's probably the best genre to get into, sadly. Yeah. Man, what are we making for game? Why are we making strategy? It's like a B tier. We could have just made Deep Space Waifu or like Waifu Blacksmith. And or a Waifu horror game, which is A and S tier, so. Yeah. Oh well, let us know how wrong we were in the comments. Yeah, of course, in the end, you know, this is our dumb opinion. Uh, I don't know if it's actually an S tier, but hey, if you stuck around till now, thanks for watching, I guess. Um, we'd like to make these tier lists from time to intersperse with the more serious like game dev stuff. So yeah, if you're new here, we make the game dev videos. We've released our own game Forge Industry. We're also making our next game, which I promise you is not going to be a waifu game yet. Uh, yet? Hold up. <laughs> 
First I heard of it. We need to deal with the YouTube, you know, but at a later point, who knows? So if that's something that interests you, be sure to head down below and give us a subscribe as it really helps us out. You get these videos twice a week and yeah, you can just learn more about game dev, running a studio and things like that. Also, for sure, we covered every genre now. And if not, please don't comment anything. I'm not gonna make a sequel to like the third installment already. I feel like we've covered most of them. We thought we covered everything the first time and now we had did two more times. Yeah. So please have mercy on our souls. Anyways, that's all we really have to say. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.